Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about type 2 diabetes, latest treatment updates and guidelines is Dr. Matthew Mintz. Dr. Mintz is a fellow in the American College of Physicians and has been a principal investigator for several research projects related to diabetes. He is currently a solo practitioner in Bethesda, Maryland. In addition to concierge services he offers to his patients, he is one of the few physicians who certifies patients in both the state of Maryland and the District of Columbia for medical cannabis as part of his regular practice. He is an expert in CBD and medical cannabis and is the author of the book, Medical Marijuana and CBD, A Physician's Guide for Patients. How are you doing today, Dr. Mintz? I'm great, Jason, thanks for having me. Yes, sir, thank you so much, doctor. We are looking forward to this one. Before we get started though, for those that are joining us today, a little bit of housekeeping, uh, type your questions in, time permitting at the end, we will do everything in our power to get those questions answered. So Dr. Mintz, type two diabetes, latest treatment updates and guidelines. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, happy to be talking to everyone today. Um, again, my name is Dr. Matthew Mintz. Uh, what we're going to cover today, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, uh, some of the risks associated with type 2 diabetes. Uh, for those of you who have it, the best way to take care of it. Uh, we'll focus a lot on diet and exercise as a way to help control diabetes. And then finally, we'll end with some of the newest treatments that are out there for type 2 diabetes. And as Jason mentioned, um, you know, we'll have some plenty of time at the end for question and answer. So please do type those questions in because uh, I do want to answer your questions today. Just a little bit more about myself. Um, uh, I've been in practice now for uh, over 23 years. Uh, the first 20 years I uh, was spent as a full-time faculty member at the George Washington University School of Medicine. I uh, split my time between uh, seeing patients and teaching our students. And then a little over three years ago, uh, I decided to open up my own practice uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. So I'm still affiliated and I have a faculty appointment at GW. Um, as well as uh, I have privileges at Suburban Hospital and GW Hospital downtown. Uh, the kind, I'm located in the Wildwood Medical Center. The kind of practice I have is a membership practice or a concierge practice. And so what that means is, is rather than have, you know, the typical 2,000, 3,000 patients that a typical doctor has seeing 25 patients a day, I only have a few hundred patients and we only see a couple patients a day. And that allows me uh, to be available for my patients when they need it. So we offer same day appointments, next day appointments, 24 seven phone access. P patients can email me, they can text me. Uh, we just very, it's really try to take the pain points out of the healthcare system, try to bring back medicine to sort of the old days when you know your doctor and your doctor knew you and was there for you when you needed. So that's the kind of practice that I have. And uh, as Jason mentioned, I do medical cannabis and CBD and we can talk about that another time. Uh, but I do mostly regular internal medicine, primary care, diabetes, cholesterol, asthma, emphysema, all physicals, all those kind of things. And today we're going to focus again on, on diabetes. So type 1 versus type 2. So they used to call type 1 juvenile diabetes and type 2 adult diabetes. And while it is true that most type 1s are children and you usually see the diagnosis under 40 and most type 2 diabetics are adults and uh, very, very common in seniors, about 25% of those 65 and older have type 2 diabetes. Uh, juvenile and adult aren't really true anymore. Number one, um, children are becoming more and more obese and unfortunately getting type 2 diabetes, which is related to weight. And then you also see a few um, uh, old, uh, old uh, adults, young adults typically, that develop a late onset type 1 diabetes. So there's a little bit of overlap, and that's why we use the term type 1 and type 2. So again, type 1 is usually in, 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 in children, young adults, uh, and the cause is much different. So it has to do with the that there's not, um, not enough insulin. We don't really know what causes type 1 diabetes. There's some theories that viruses can start it. There's some other theories about food, but it's an autoimmune disorder likely. What that means is the body... Uh, thinks that the pancreas, which is the gland that produces insulin that everyone has, is somehow uh, an invader and so starts at using its own immune system to attack it. And the, the, the cells in the pancreas called beta cells get destroyed, don't produce insulin. So unfortunately, type 1 diabetics require and need insulin to survive. Type 2 diabetes is a little bit in, different. There's, there's, their insulin is there 
And in fact, early on in the disease, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of insulin. The problem is, is that type 2 diabetics can't use it. They've become insulin resistant. So even though the body has enough insulin, it can't use insulin. And what insulin does is it takes the sugar from the food that we eat and gives it to the cells, puts it into the cells for energy so that we can grow and survive. And so the type 2 diabetics have insulin, they just can't use it. And why can't they use it? Why do we become insulin resistant? And there's a lot of factors. Uh, genetics is one component, and certain ethnicities uh, have a higher incidence of type 2 diabetes. Uh, certain families, uh, it runs in families, but it's mostly related to weight. There's something about being obese, having excess fat. Uh, the theory is, is that fat gets oxidized, and the oxidized fat destroys the cells making them resistant to insulin. So most type 2 diabetics actually don't need insulin. Uh, that being said, if type 2 diabetes is present for years and years and untreated, then those, those beta cells, those cells in the pancreas that, were, that make insulin, eventually get tired out. And so there are many type 2 diabetics that over time require insulin. But that's the main difference between the two, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. All right, so why do we need to treat? What do we treat? Why do we treat type 2 diabetes? you actually rarely do not die of elevated sugar. So you know, we, we tend to focus on sugar because sugar is elevated in diabetes, but high sugar doesn't kill you. Um, very rarely does it do that. So um, you, know, you can certainly get instances where sugars are in the 800s or 900s and you can go into a coma, so it can happen. But mostly when it's not the sugar that kills you, it's the complications from diabetes that cause uh, disease and ultimately death. And so the reason why we treat diabetes is not to get your sugar low, though that's a part of the treatment, is to prevent these complications, these complications of diabetes. And you can break down diabetes complications into two things, what we call microvascular and macrovascular. Microvascular are the small blood vessels in our body that supply various organs. And so um, the blood vessels in the eye uh, are damaged with type 2 diabetes, and that's and type 2 diabetes is one of the leading causes of blindness. Blindness. Uh, the small vessels supply the nerves, and so you can get what's called a diabetic neuropathy. Um, it can cause pain, and patients with diabetic nerve pain or diabetic neuropathy can suffer greatly. It also causes decreased sensation, and so because diabetics don't heal very well as well, uh, they can injure their foot and don't even realize it. Uh, and that diabetes is one of the leading causes of amputation. And finally, the small vessels that supply our kidney, diabetes is the, one of the leading causes of kidney failure. And so you can lose your kidney function and be on dialysis like in the picture. So those are the microvascular complications and the macrovascular are bigger blood vessels and damage to the bigger blood vessels caused from diabetes leads to heart attack or stroke. And those are the biggest risks for death for patients with diabetes is heart attack and stroke. And so while we focus on sugar management, we're really treating diabetes to prevent these complications, to prevent uh, kidney failure, to prevent blindness, to prevent neuropathy, and to prevent heart attack and stroke. And so that's why we treat type 2 diabetes. And so therefore, when we think about how do we treat diabetes, it's more than just treating the blood. It's more than just treating the sugar. There's lots of things. First of all, we need to diet and exercise, not only to lower the sugar, but to lower the risk of these, these things that I just mentioned. Smoke also leads to vessel disease and kidney disease and heart disease and stroke. So if you're a smoker and you're a diabetic, that's a double whammy. So you've got to stop smoking. The other things that lead to um, uh, heart attacks and strokes are blood pressure and cholesterol. So while we always want to treat uh, high blood pressure, it's more, more important in type 2 diabetics to treat that, to monitor and treat the blood pressure to prevent the risk for heart attacks and strokes. Similar with cholesterol, you know, even while, while we usually use cholesterol-lowering medications to treat high cholesterol, cholesterol is such an important factor that pretty much every diabetic, regardless of their level of cholesterol, needs to be on a cholesterol-lowering medication. In addition, we want to check on these organs that are at risk for damage. So every diabetic needs to see the eye doctor once a year to look for those early signs of, of diabetic eye disease because there are treatments available, but we have to go see the eye doctor once a year to get what's called a dilated fundoscopy, to have the eye doctor take a really good close look. 
Kidneys need to be checked once a year for early signs of kidney disease. There are a couple, in addition to treating diabetes, there are other treatments for kidney disease that can be helpful, so picking up that early. Uh, diabetics should get their foot checked regularly, either by their primary care physician or by a podiatrist uh, to make sure there's no damage to the feet, because again, you can't, you don't always look at your feet, and diabetics, if they have neuropathy, can't always feel their feet, so you don't know if something bad's going on, so you also need to check, um, check the feet. So those are the major treatments, the major focus of treatment for diabetes, diet, exercise, not smoking, treating high blood pressure, controlling the cholesterol, checking on the kidneys and the eye and the feet, and then also checking the sugar. So it's not that sugar is not important, but it's not the only thing that's important. We have to focus on all these other things as well. Now, one of the questions I always get from patients is, do I need to check my own sugar? Uh, and the answer is usually not uh, for type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is different because uh, type 1 diabetes uh, diabetics need insulin, and insulin can uh, increase your risk of low blood sugars. And so if, if you're on insulin, then you need to check, check the sugar. So again, I, as I mentioned, many type 2 diabetics are able to get control without insulin. Um, and so if you're not on insulin or there's another medicine called sulfonylurea, uh, glipizide is an example. We'll come back to that in a second that can lower your blood sugar. Uh, so as long as you're not on insulin or a sulfonylurea, you really, in my opinion, don't need to be checking your sugars all the time, which can be very scary for patients. It's, a, it's a, you know, in addition to cost, it's a big hassle. People get really worried about it. So no, you don't have to check your finger sticks with these monitors and stuff like that. Uh, if, if you're a type 2 diabetic and are not on insulin, or not on a sulfonylurea. Uh, what we do need to check is a hemoglobin A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is a blood test that, that your doctor does or the lab does, not that you prick your finger, but a regular lab test that helps determine how your overall sugar is controlled. And so basically a normal A1C is about 4.5 to 5.5. Anything over 5.6 to 6.5 is considered pre-diabetes. Once you hit 6.5, that's considered diabetic. And then when we have someone who's diagnosed with diabetes, we want it, our goal is to get that A1C under seven, because we know that over seven increases those risks of the things that I just talked about, heart attack, stroke, kidney disease, blindness, et cetera. So we want to keep the A1C at least below seven. So for people who diabetics were trying to get control, we check it every three months. Once your A1C is a goal under 7%, we usually recommend checking that. Again, it's a blood test um, uh, done every six months. But finger sticks, checking your blood sugar at home with your finger sticks, really only necessary for certain type 2s and, and type 1 diabetics on insulin. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of things that we need to do, but diet and exercise are probably the two most important things, just in general, but especially if you have um, diabetes. Um, and it's important to note that it's, it's more about weight than about sugar. Because again, remember, the, the primary problem with type 2 diabetes is not lack of insulin, but it's the inability to, to use insulin. And the ability to use insulin is affected by weight. So when the weight goes down, the body is able to use the insulin more and it lowers the sugar. So it's not just not eating sugar. It's basically about lowering calories so you can lower weight. So if you're eating healthy and you can't lose weight, that even if you're eating healthy, you're probably eating too much. Uh, so there's lots of things that you can work with with your, uh, with your primary care provider to get that calorie count down. One of the things I recommend to patients is to look for something called hidden calories. Uh, hidden calories are uh, things that you don't even realize you're having calories, like salad dressing. So salads are super healthy, uh, but if you're putting high calorie dressing on it, that can make the salad actually very high in calories. Uh, beverages are a good source of hidden calories. Uh, people don't realize, oh, I'm drinking juice. Juice is healthy. Well, juice is high in calories. Even though it's healthy, it's high in calories. Um, and you may not need that. You'd be better off with water. Empty calories mean uh, caloric intake without any nutritional value. A good example of empty calories is alcohol. So alcohol has no nutritional value, and it's all carbohydrates. So the body just converts it to sugar. So you know, just if you're drinking two or three drinks a day, just cutting that down will, will substantially lower your calories, will lower your weight, and allow your body to use uh, the insulin that it needs uh, better. So it's not just about not eating sweets. It's about basically losing weight. And part of that is making sure that if you have a diet, you stick to the diet that works for you. So if, it's, if, if um, you know, and, you know, people can you know, fast and do crazy diets, but if, it's not gonna, if you're not going to stick to it, then it's not worth it. So you want to do something 
that's going to work for you, which in my opinion is generally keeping, eat what you like to eat, but just eat less of it and make sure it's healthy, healthy foods. Um, but it's really about lowering the calories. And then finally, exercise. Also very important. You don't have to go join a gym, though. Um, it has more benefits than just weight loss, specifically for type 2 diabetics. One of the things that helps the body utilize insulin or beat insulin resistance is exercise. It increases uh, insulin sensitivity, just exercise alone. Again, you don't have to join a gym. It doesn't have to be ridiculously intense. Uh, even a hundred, the CDC recommends 150 minutes of moderate activity uh, weekly. So that's about 30 minutes five, most days of the week, five days of the week. So if you're doing 30 minutes of, of sort of moderate activity, most days of the week, five days a week, that's gonna get you your 150 minutes. And so it's not that hard to do. One of the things I recommend patients uh, is to consider getting a step counter like a Fitbit. Uh, most phones have apps for free that you can do this. So if you keep your phone in your pocket, uh, you can just use your phone, but you have these like wrist watches, or you know, if you have the Apple watch that has that in it, but if you don't have that, you can get one of these Fitbit watches or Fitbit devices and count your steps. And if you're getting close to 10,000 steps a day, that's probably all that you need to, to meet that CDC recommendation of 150 minutes of moderate activity, just with walking. Um, so uh, certainly that should be enough, uh, both for sugar utilization and weight loss. So diet, something that you can do, something that reduces calories, something that you can stick with, and exercise, don't have to join a gym, you know, 30 minutes, five days a week, counting steps is a good way to do that. Both of those things should help overall help as well as your, reduce your risk of complication for type 2 diabetes. All right, lastly, uh, last few minutes, I want to talk about the medications for type 2 diabetes. And there's a lot of recommendations. The one that I use is from the endocrinologist. So the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists and the American College of Endocrinology, the two academic societies for endocrinologists, they're doctors that specialize in diabetes. They come together once a year. To, to generate guidelines. Uh, and they have guidelines for medications and specifically what to use. And so for first line therapy, here's a list of their medications in order of recommendation. So then we'll go over all of these individually. So the first line medication for most diabetics is metformin. Uh, it's been around for a long time. It's available uh, generically. It works really well, not too many side effects. But interestingly, the next two medications are the newer medicines for diabetes, uh, GLP-1 receptor, receptor agonist and SGLT-2 inhibitors. And I'll talk about these medicines, but these are newer medicines. And the reason why they're listed uh, higher has to do with the fact that these medications, unlike other medications, have proven to reduce heart attacks and save lives. And that's important. As I mentioned, the reason why we're treating diabetes is not for the sugar, it's to reduce the complications of which heart attack and stroke are the most important one. And we now have these newer medications which have proven beyond lowering sugar that we can reduce heart disease. And so that's why the endocrinologists have recommended these newer medications over some of the older ones. So basically, regardless of what the sugar is, this is a new recommendation from the 2020 uh, ACE uh, guidelines that if you have established heart disease, heart attack or stroke, or at very high risk, if you have kidney disease or you have heart failure, you should start with one of these two or new medications. Um, even if you've already been on metformin you know, or haven't started metformin, it's recommended that those people with the highest risk with heart disease and kidney disease be started on these medications. And this is a new recommendation. Other medications include the DPB-4 medications, uh, and there are some other medicines as well that I won't, I can answer questions about, I won't spend time on. But the most important thing, in addition to these newer medicines having these uh, improvements in heart attacks, is that the older medicines, sulfa, SU stands for sulfonuria. These are older medicines. They're very popular, glipicide, glyphoride. They've been around forever. They're at the bottom of the list, and they're at the bottom of the list for a couple reasons. One, they cause high, uh, they have caused hypoglycemia, which is uh, the blood sugar getting too low. None of the other medicines listed cause the blood sugar being too low, which is why I said if you, you don't have to check your sugar unless you're on one of these medicines. And, and the low blood sugar or hypoglycemia is more than just feeling bad and needing a piece of candy. You, it can kill you. Uh, and in fact, these medications, sulfonurias, have uh, death and heart attack warnings uh, because of this risk. So the low blood sugar can be very serious. It can cause the need to go to the emergency room, hospital, or even death. And so because of this risk factor of, 
of low blood sugar and the severity of it, uh, the endocrinologist in their guidelines recommend these as last line therapies, that you should try all these other medicines before even considering some of these older medications. All right, so like I said, the first medication uh, that's recommended is the uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist. GLP is a hormone that we have in our body. And what it does is it tells the pancreas to release insulin when it needs it. It's very different than the sulfonylureas, which just uh, tell the pancreas to release insulin all the time uh, or insulin itself. So it doesn't have a lot of the side effects and again, can prevent heart attacks in certain patients. Uh, most of these medicines are injectable. Um, some of them, the newer ones are once weekly, like Trulicity, Victoza is another one um, that is, um, uh, is, is a daily medicine. Uh, there's a couple of really good side effects uh, from these medicines. Can upset the stomach a little bit, but one of the best side effects is it can lead to weight loss. And so that's a good side effect. One of the newest G, uh, GLPs is ribelsis. Ribelsis is the only oral agent. So uh, all the other ones are injectables. We finally have an oral GLP-1. So that's really exciting. So that's something to consider. It's called ribelsis. So those are the GLP-1s, the newer medications. The other new medications are the SGLT2 inhibitors. So SGLT2 is a receptor that we have on our kidneys uh, that prevents us from uh, losing sugar. Uh, these medicines block that. So essentially what we do is we urinate sugar and that helps lower the blood sugar. Uh, but again, these are medicines that help prevent heart attacks and strokes. And why is that? Uh, we don't really know, but it, like the GLP-1s, they also lead to weight loss. Another thing that these medicines will do, medicines like Jardians, medicines like Farsiga, will work. They work like a diuretic so that they, uh, they, um, they lower the blood pressure. They're a fluid pill so that you, you lose fluid and they can reduce blood pressure. So it's possibly weight loss or blood pressure are helping with these heart improvements. Um, but these are also medicines to consider taking sort of first line, especially if you're at risk. Uh, I mentioned metformin. It's still considered a first line agent uh, if you don't have risk for heart disease, kidney disease. Um, it's considered first line. It can upset the stomach a little bit, but it's very effective. It is also generic. Uh, DPP-4 medicines um, block um, the breakdown of our own uh, GLP-1. Like I said, we make our own GLP-1, the DPP-4 inhibitors block the uh, the breakdown of that so it increases your own levels. Genubia is an example of a DPP-4 inhibitor. And again, like I said, there are other medicines that you can use, uh, but uh, glipizide or these sulfonylureas are now the last medicine because of the side effect and their risk for heart disease. So that is a very, very quick summary of sort of all the medications that you can take and where they are sort of recommended. I, I think that the new thing, the thing to take away, the sort of newest research is there are two classes of medications, the GLP-1s like ribelsis and the SGLT-2s like Farsiga uh, or Jardians uh, that in addition to lowering sugar can prevent heart attacks and that's why the experts sort of recommend them. And they're no longer recommending them or they're recommending as a last resort these very popular medicines like glipizide and gliburide uh, because they don't have those improvements and in fact can cause some risk. So that's a very quick summary of the medication. So, you know, in conclusion, I think we have about five or 10 minutes for uh, questions. Uh, we talked about the difference of type one and type two diabetes. It's no longer adult and juvenile onset. There's some overlap, uh, but for type two diabetics, it's not about not having enough insulin. It's about not being able to use insulin. And so insulin puts the sugar in our cells. And so diabetics have uh, high levels of sugar. And while it's important to, to focus on sugar, uh, really, we want to treat the complications, heart disease, stroke, kidney failure, eye failure, things like that. And so while we want to focus on sugar, we also want to focus on preventing those complications. And how do we do that? We check things. We check the blood pressure. We check the eyes. We check the kidneys. We start cholesterol medicines. Uh, we treat high blood pressure. We stop smoking if we're smoking. And we focus on diet and exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, as far as diet, again, it's not about sugar or eating sugar. Uh, it's about the weight. So we really got to get the weight down to improve insulin sensitivity. Same thing with exercise. You don't have to join the gym. Just even modest ex activity most days of the week is enough to help with the weight loss, to help utilize uh, sugar. Uh, so that's recommended for all people. And then I spent the last few minutes talking about uh, the medications. And the main thing was that there are these newer treatments 
GLP-1s like ribelsis or SGLT-2s like Jardians that not only lower sugar very effectively, but can prevent heart attack. And the experts, at least in 2020, are recommending these much earlier and recommending older medicines like sulfonylurea, such as glipizide, much, much later, avoiding really if possible because they cause uh, these low sugars. Uh, so with that, um, that's a quick sort of overview of diabetes focusing on type 2. I'll turn it back to Jason, who hopefully has uh, your questions, and I'm happy to take all your questions. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mintz. Uh, quite a few questions here. First one, is my PPC sufficient, or if I have type 2 diabetes, do I need to see an endocrinologist? Oh, so I'm assuming that P the, the PPC is for primary care physician or PCC. So if you're, yeah, I, I rarely send patients to an endocrinologist. I'm okay. very comfortable treating type 2 diabetes. Uh, it all depends, though, on the comfort level of, of the primary care physician and how busy they are. This takes time. And so one of the reasons I have the kind of practice that I have is so I can spend time with patients. And so I have the time and I have the knowledge to be able to manage these. And so generally, I don't recommend. So if your physician is comfortable you know, with these medications and prescribing them and monitoring you and having the time to talk to you about this and controlling your sugar and control and focusing on diet and exercise, then yes, the most primary care physicians should be able to handle this. Um, but if they don't have time, then yes, yeah, certainly you can see an endocrinologist, but you don't have to. Now that's for type two. With type ones, it's a little bit different. It's hard to get started. It's uh, sometimes you need a little extra uh, handle, and, and, and in many cases, the pediatricians will send the children to the pediatric endocrinologist. So, but for adults with type 2 diabetes, most internist family physicians should be able to handle that. Um, will Farxiga, I'm probably pronouncing that incorrect, Farxiga, F-A-R-X-I-G-A, will that help with edema? Yeah, so you pronounced it correctly. It's Farxiga. Farxiga is one of these SGLT2 inhibitors. So if Farxiga, uh, Jardians, there's a couple others. Um, and what they do is they, like I said, they block the kidney from reabsorbing sugar. So your, your kidney only uh, pees, pees out some waste products and some water, and so normally doesn't pee out sugar. And so what this does is that these medicines, these SGLT2s like Farsiga, uh, block that mechanism. So you purposely pee out sugar. And so when you're peeing out sugar, you're lowering the sugar, so that's good, but you're, but you're peeing out two other things. Number one, you're peeing out calories, so it helps you to lose weight. But when you pee out sugar, it usually draws water with it, so it functions like a diuretic. So it lowers blood pressure, and if you have edema, it can also treat edema as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I mentioned earlier, you know, I went pretty quickly, but one of the sort of um, predisposing conditions is heart failure. And so these drugs, these SGLT2s, are now being considered in heart failure even without diabetes, but certainly with diabetes because of their diuretic effects. And so, yes, they can, they can help with edema and fluid. So they're, they're a good medication to, to consider. All right, Dr. Mintz, you already talked about diet. I just have a question here. So, as you know, there are quite a few, I don't say call them fads, but, you know, different types of diets. I know you said it's more about just the amount of food you intake, but would you say there's any diets out there that you, as if you have type 2 diabetes, that you would stay away from? Uh, stay away from, no, I don't think they're, well, let me think about that for a second. Um, I think my recommendation for type 2 diabetes would be no different for people who are trying to lose weight. Which is, which is you should do the diet that you think works for you that you're going to stick to. So a good example is there are people who swear by vegan diets, which means all vegetables, uh, some fruits, but like no meats, no plant, no eggs, nothing, no fish, pure vegan. And they'll tell you that it, you know, it's good for weight loss, it's good for longevity. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, and they have data that shows that it's, you know, good for weight loss, good for longevity. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have ketogenic diets, like the Atkins diet or the keto diet, where it's very low carbohydrate in all meats and proteins. And they, too, have data that shows that it helps lose weight and helps longevity. Well, they both can't be right. You know, it's, <laughs> they, can't be, they, they both can't be right. And the reality is, is it really probably doesn't matter how much you eat or how much what foods you eat, but how much you eat. And so it's really about calories and, and gaining weight. So if you're a meat lover, you know, going on a vegan diet is not a good idea because you're not going to stick to it. What you want to do is get a diet that you can stick to and then also focus on the calories. 
because you can gain weight on a vegan diet. You can gain weight on a keto diet if you're having too many calories. So there's not like magic foods that help you lose weight. It's about calories. And there are some reasons to go with different various diets. Uh, somewhere in between is the Mediterranean diet, which is, not, which is low carb, but not no carb. Uh, it, it's not vegan. It allows for some uh, proteins, but, but not, it's not heavy protein. So that's in the middle. But all of them will work, but it's really more importantly like what you can do and what you can stick to. Uh, what about zero calorie drinks? I know you, you've, you're really hitting water, oh, which obviously a, makes sense. That's a hard question. That's a super, super hard question. And the reason why is because normally, based on what I just said, you would think that zero calorie drinks are the way to go. I said, don't drink soda. You know, those are unnecessary calories. And what if I have a zero calorie drink? Here's the problem. There's some research looking at zero artificial sweeteners that suggests it can be linked with both weight and diabetes. The mechanism is not clear. Um, one of the thoughts is, is that the, while the zero calorie drinks taste sweet, they don't fool the body. And so the body thinks it's having something sweet, but then realizes it's not. And that can cause cravings for sweets later on. And so they've done studies like in nurses, for example, where they study nurses and uh, drinking Diet Coke was associated with more weight gain, not less weight gain. So the jury's not entirely you know, clear, or I don't say the jury's out on this, but it's not entirely clear you know, whether the benefit of zero calorie drinks is worth the potential risk of some of the other effects. So the best zero calorie drink is water. Water has no negative effects, it's great. But whether or not you, know, you should drink Diet Coke essentially is unclear. There are some potential risks. So if you could avoid it or minimize it and drink water instead, that would be better. Um, but I, I can't say it's, it's clearly harmful, but there is some concern. So I would try, so zero calorie drinks, I'd try to minimize if you could. Okay. Last question, Dr. Mintz. If, if you could look into the future, uh, are there any research or are there anything going on as far as the treatments for diabetics, uh, that excite you? Uh, that's a good question. Um, we're, you know, we have all these newer molecules now. Uh, the GLP-1s, as I mentioned, are very exciting. We finally have an oral agent, Ribelsis, um, so that's a little bit easier. Um, and, you know, I think we'll see more research with these medications. So we have a, a couple for type 2 diabetes, some really good new agents in our armamentarium to treat patients. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that excites me is more for the type 1, but it has to do with the delivery uh, and uh, measurement of sugar. So uh, you have, um, there are these um, figure stick free monitors. Uh, Freestyle Libre is one of them where instead of pricking your finger to check sugar, you wear a little thing on your chest or, or your arm that continuously checks the sugar and you can use your smartphone to see what the sugar reading is. Similarly, we've been with insulin pumps, that technology has gotten better. There are new things that are like pods, similar to these glucose monitors. They like sit on your, without any hooks or, or wires or, or, or tubes, sit on your chest and deliver insulin. And I think they last for like a month. And the next step is to get these devices talking to each other so that you're continuously monitoring your sugar and you're giving yourself you know, automatically insulin when you need it. Uh, using your smartphone as sort of a portable computer. And so that's essentially an artificial pancreas. And so we're almost there. We're, we're already seeing some of these in studies where, you know, you won't have to, a kid will get type 1 diabetes and it won't be like this huge major concern. They'll be able to get their sugars under control and use these wearable technologies and get it under really good control without, you know, worrying about, you know, checking their sugar or what they eat and things like that. So the monitoring and the delivery of insulin, the monitoring of sugar and delivering of insulin is really, technology-wise, has really gotten improved. And so that's very interesting. I'm excited about that. Well, good. Well, Dr. Metz, how can people find you? Uh, so, yeah, so I'm in Bethesda. And so I put my contact uh, information here. I'm on Old Georgetown Road. Uh, they can call me at 855-MINTS-MD or 855-646-8963. They can go to my website, drmints.com, and they can uh, Email me directly with any additional questions or anything about my practice, whatever they want, at drmints at gmail.com. Real quick, for those of us that will be uh, listening to this on our uh, podcast, that's drmintz at gmail.com. So, uh, 
Dr. Mintz, I'm going to go ahead and talk a little bit about our webinar that we have together on uh, November 10th. It's going to be medical marijuana, me medical marijuana and CBD, a physician's guide for patients. Can you tell us a little bit about that webinar coming up on November 10th? Yeah, so you know it's interesting. There is um, there's a lot on um, me medical marijuana is legal in the District of Columbia and the state of Maryland, as well as 33 other states in the United States. Um, and there's a lot on the internet about medical marijuana or medical marijuana and how to use it, but there's not really good information about what specifically to take for which diseases. And so there's a lot of confusion. So I'm going to go over sort of what is medical marijuana, what can you use it for, what's the latest research show, how do you take it, where do you get it, do you have to smoke it, what are the other ways to use it, if I'm interested, you know, how do I get my certification in my card and where do I go to get it. So I'll try to run through that, you know, briefly. And, and again, sort of like today, I'll be happy to answer questions. Okay. Um, so you can find this webinar. Once we're done today, I'll go ahead and put this on YouTube. You can find us on YouTube, Knowledgeable Aging. Uh, our podcast can be found on Spotify, Apple Tunes as well. Till next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging.